<laughs> we're getting a late start, but we had some things going on and it's always a joy for me to know that someone is about to enter the kingdom. So we had that tonight, which is a really great way to spend the night. But I wanted to address a few things that we commonly hear and frequently hear. And I think if people actually knew what the Bible said, they wouldn't say these things because they would know what it really meant in the Bible. So I'm going to just wrap around a couple of things that are commonly stated when we're trying to unravel um, problems that people are having that have become systemic. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind, even to give each man according to his ways, according to the results of his deeds. And so that's how God sees the heart. He sees the heart as deceitful, more deceitful than all else, and desperately sick. That's how God sees the heart. And so when we frequently hear, God knows my heart, Frequently, in defense of whatever it is that's going on, well, I know it looks like this, but God knows my heart. According to the Bible, that is not something you want to use as your defense because it, it's exactly the opposite in reality that you will face if you don't change that belief system. We can do anything we want in the name of following our heart and many have made life decision decisions based on that terrible advice that they get from someone that they are somehow entitled to follow their heart or follow your heart i mean you hear this all the time it is absolutely terrible advice and it has got, caused irreparable damage to many lives and if anybody teaches other people to follow your heart that is the absolute worst advice you could possibly give another human. Many spouses have walked away from marriages that they deemed unhappy at the time only to end up in a much worse situation because the blessing of God lifted off their life. Children get destroyed in the mix. Lives are completely changed. You cannot get back to where you could have made this thing work according to the plan of God or in obedience to God because you followed your heart. Many have become workaholics because they seek a status, a financial security that their heart wants. And again, there's the casualty of the children of other relationships that are really important. So much casualty in following their heart. We should not follow our hearts. We absolutely should not follow our hearts. And we should never teach young people or children to follow their hearts because it is a very dangerous way to think. And we can see in the school systems that they're allowing children to follow their hearts. And we see where that is going already in their lives. And to many people, the fact that God knows our hearts is comforting to them. It's a way of releasing them from the judgment of other people when others may say, I've done something wrong, but God knows my heart. Sometimes it's even in defense of our self-condemnation, we might see that we've done wrong, but we think, I've slipped up, but God knows my heart. He knows I'm doing much better than I used to. In fact, the Bible says God does know our hearts, but in the sense that we should fear him because he knows our hearts. We can fool people with our choices, but we cannot fool God. Jesus really does know our hearts, and God's mercy is great indeed, but his mercy is not an excuse for us to have faults and then brush over them with, 
God knows my heart. That does not excuse anything about our heart. Our heart is excused only by the blood of Jesus Christ, not because of anything about our motives being right or pure or misguided or ignorance. There is absolutely zero position for that. So if you're going through religious practices thinking that you're impressing God, and it may make other people believe that you're a holy and righteous person. You may even think that you're a holy and righteous person. You go to church every Sunday, Bible study every week. You go, you have prayer meetings or you pray faithfully daily. And the heart will make you feel that you're ready for heaven when the truth is your heart is far away from God. And I can tell you, Jesus is soon to return. It's very clear Jesus is soon to return. And many of the same people who have solid religious structure to their lives have family members living in their own home or certainly close to them, people all around them who are obviously lost. They have absolutely no concern for that. That will show you how far your heart is from God. Because if God did know your heart and it was pleasing to him, you would be right now very fervently trying to reach others for Christ because eternity is at stake for each one of them. The heart will trick us into becoming self-righteous and then we begin to compare ourselves towards others based on outward conduct. It is truly a wicked system of imagination and it is not true, it is not accurate, it is wicked in the sight of God. Matthew 15, 8 says, These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And Jesus corrects the Pharisees and ministers to the Gentiles. Their hearts were in the world and after what they desired the most. They made religion a tool to their secular purposes, supposing gain to be god godliness. They wanted the applause of men when they if they were right with God, they would seek to be in love with Jesus Christ. That's it. Just obeying Jesus, not trying to look good. He wants our hearts stayed on him, only him. And the spirit of pride in our heart will cause us to believe that we are not sinful because of that pride in our heart that holds that all together. So when Jesus said in Luke 16, 15, God knows your heart. He was actually speaking to the Pharisees. These were men who lived double lives. Outwardly, they sought public approval. They made a point of following all the religious rules. They worked hard to impress people so that they would appear to be godly and wise. But God knew their hearts. He saw through their phony, pious displays. He could see exactly what was on the inside. And Luke called these Pharisees lovers of money. And Jesus said to them, You like to appear righteous in public, but God knows your hearts. What this world honors is detestable in the sight of God. Jesus had just finished teaching about wealth and possessions. Through a parable, he showed that the genuine followers obey God and his word rather than pay homage to those things in the world that the world values, such as money and status. He closed with a piercing caution to people who attempt to live double lives. No one can serve two masters. Either you hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money because God knew that at the core of the heart of a Pharisee, they serve money. They're only generous with their money, oftentimes in public on occasions where people can see that they gave they claim their wealth as god's reward for their righteous living and their good standing with him and god called them out for their greed self-indulgence hypocrisy and said woe to you teachers of the law and pharisees you are hypocrites you clean the outside of the cup and dish but inside you are full of greed and self-indulgence blind pharisees first clean the inside of the cup and dish then the outside will also be clean. You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of the bones of the dead and everything unclean. Matthew 23, 
25 through 27. There are many in ministry positions currently in such critical times that are more concerned with the number of people inside their ministry, the bottom dollar line, the stats, whatever that may be. They sit and are more focused on those things than they are on the one thing that matters to God, and that is that Jesus has all of our worship. He is our only why and the lost around us. That's it. In the Bible, the heart refers to a person's inner moral and spiritual life. God sees what is done in secret. It says his eyes roam throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. Second Chronicles 16.9 He knows the motives behind every action, every word, because he knows every human heart. And since God knows our hearts, we ought to always live to please only him and not worry about trying to impress people. But there are many false gospels today that are giving people a, quite a few different delusions. There's not any, there's so many of them now, it's hard to even keep track. But every person will be held accountable for whatever false gospel they chose because the Bible is clear about the real gospel. And if you believe a false gospel, you did it deliberately on purpose because the Bible would have cleared that up for you. The true gospel says that humanity is created in the image of God, that they sinned against God, they incurred the curse of sin, which is death. Jesus reversed the curse through his life, death, burial, and resurrection, and it will all be restored, new heavens and new earth under the rule of King Jesus. That is the true gospel. But there's a false gospel. One of them is God knows my heart. And in this one, God created humans to be good. People have, some of the people are mean. Some people do bad things. And even though our actions are bad, our intentions could be good and then God will accept me because my intentions were good so the problem with that is is many people don't see a need for Jesus because their bad things were not meant to be bad things and God knows their heart and he knows their intentions were good so this whole God knows my heart begins with the lie that God created people to be good. Instead of being good, some people have collapsed under the curse of wanting to cause harm to others, being psychopaths, numb to the pain they cause other people. They're less than human. And in contrast, God knows my heart is good news for the opposite group of people who are better people and while these people can do things that look bad and they can even be haunted by the guilt of their bad deeds they're good-hearted individuals and they know the simple phrase God knows my heart yes I've made mistakes my temper gets the best of me I make poor choices sometimes with addiction I reluctantly engage in corrupt business or um, things within marriage, but I don't mean any harm. God knows my heart. As man studies his own intentions, his motivation seems sincere. For many people, I meet them all the time. They have evaluated themselves as sincere and put all of their bad choices under good intentions and therefore God must conclude that they are fundamentally good people and according to this false gospel ultimate restoration means that God accepts one based on 
their own perceived purity of their own heart. And many people really feel they're very nice people. They have good intentions. And sometimes people don't even know why they do the bad things they do. And they are genuinely bothered by them. They're crushed by the weight of their own guilt at times. And some really hate their sin. Yet the other part won't go to the Bible to find out the true gospel. It has nothing to do with any of those things. But these people continue to think that the bad things are not who they really are. They're better than that. So the God knows my heart gospel, false gospel, brings temporary relief to this weary group. It separates their failures and actions from who they really think they want to be. A guilty conscience is soothed by good intentions. And even though their actions are bad, they believe their intentions were good for the most part overall. And that they have a sincere heart. They believe, therefore, that God accepts them because God knows their heart. And the truth is, your heart does not justify you. It condemns you. The constant need to prove and defend testifies against you that your heart is indeed wicked. The pride that testifies against you, Jesus said, in Matthew 15, 18 through 20, what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart and defiles a person. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person. Your failures are not disconnected from a pure heart. It's the opposite. Your actions testify against your heart. And it says and agrees with God that it's desperately sick. God spoke through the prophet Ezekiel in Ezekiel 36, 26 and says, And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove that heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. So the true gospel begins with the confession that we have a sinful, wicked heart and hope for forgiveness through the blood of Jesus Christ only. And God regenerates the sinner by replacing the bad heart with a new heart. And in this new life, you love the Lord your God with all your heart. That's what it does. We never once seek to justify anything at that, that point with the new heart. We, we know we are filthy according to the Bible. We only at that point seek to love Jesus. That's what the new heart does. We are never made right due to a good heart or even a new heart. We're made right because Jesus died on the cross for our sin, for our wicked heart. He took our guilt on Calvary and the God knows my heart leaves you with zero confidence before God. The true gospel of Jesus Christ tells us to draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Doug Fannin, a few years ago, he wrote about CBS News reporting Alice Dare Allen and Peter Warden made a shocking discovery about their iPhone. It seems that it was gathering data, tracking their whereabouts everywhere they went, and the phone actually records various data points that are stored and it traces the exact path a person takes whenever they're in possession of their phone. And the data could reveal all of the activities a person engaged in throughout the course of a day. And security experts fear that uncovering the whereabouts of unsuspecting spouses may cause a number of divorces if people figure out how to actually unload all this information and this will create a lot of fears of violation of privacy, which we hear a lot about now. So Apple knows where you go. They know what you text. They know what you look at. But the problem is God not only knows where you are and what you're doing, but he knows why you are doing it. So he is way ahead of any kind of technology that is scaring people. Scientists think they can detect liars by brain activity because they say it changes when you lie. The polygraph reads physiological responses such as perspiration rates, blood pressure, and heartbeat because science believes lies come from the brain, not the heart. 
But the Bible has said that all along. Science says that lies come from the brain. The Bible says the heart of man is the seat of life. It is neither the blood pump nor the brain itself, but the mind or inner being of man. The mind is the heart from which lies and evil come. This heart directs the body. The heart is the place where our intellect exists. Our will is also exercised in the heart. The source of our emotions is in the heart. Our conscience is in the heart. And God understands every heart and all the intents of our thoughts. And no one, not one person, should ever think that they have loyal hearts before God. And one way that you would know instantly is if your mind was a visible movie on the wall closest to you everywhere you went, you would know. You would then know who you were. And we won't be able to blame others on Judgment Day because God has shown us the truth many different times about how depraved we are. And at that point, if we choose not to know the truth or the solution he has provided through great loss to himself, we chose to ignore the truth. And many think they're judging, they're going to be judged by world standards, but that is not how we're going to be judged. It will be by the word of God. And that is why people should take a great priority to know what it says and not count on their church to say it. We were just discussing that. So many churches are preaching positive messages, but they're not telling you what is required for you to make heaven clearly enough that most people are understanding it because they don't. They're sure they're right with God, but they're <laughs> there's many reasons why they would be disqualified from heaven in their life, but by every standard that they have been told, they're positive that they're going to heaven. We should not follow our hearts because our hearts lie to us. They tell us that we should have what we want, but they don't warn us of the consequences of going down that path. They show a distorted view of reality and they blind us to the truth. Our hearts are wicked. An unredeemed heart is full of wickedness and sin and the redeemed heart often falls easily back into these temptations, especially when we're being told it's okay to follow our heart instead of trusting in the Lord, looking up in the word, what is the correct path to take? So anytime someone says, what does your heart tell you to do? Do the opposite. Our hearts are prone to idolatry. We start to desire something or someone more than we desire God. And then we hold on to that and we won't let God have it because we won't let it go. We want it that bad. We start to find our identity and our future and our lots of things in something or someone other than God and when we have an idol in our heart that fits that our hearts are going to continue to lead us towards the idol not towards God you cannot keep both hell will be full of many who tried you cannot keep both idolatry is a forbidden sin our hearts also don't know what's truly best for us. Only God knows what is truly best for us. And we have to see how to follow him in detail, which is in the word, and do that. Because when we follow our heart, we're easily going to step outside of his perfect plan because there's emotion involved in following our heart. It will not take us anywhere near what God has planned for us. And while we think we're providing a great future for ourselves and we can stack it all full of ministry and good looking activities and service. We very likely are missing out on something that is so incredibly hard to imagine that we would have never even known while we're sitting there thinking that our cheap, tawdry little list of things that we do for God is amazing when it's not. And it will show up for that on the last day. God will burn it up. Follow God's word. His truths are unchanging and relevant for every single aspect of our lives. And if our heart is leading us to do something that is contrary to the word, choose the word every time. Follow the advice of wise counselors. And if you don't have wise counselors, you're already not following the word. 
Proverbs 12, 15 says, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he who heeds counsel is wise. So you need to have wise counselors, period. And then listen to them. And I know that's hard to do because I've, I've gone the full range. Follow the leading of the Spirit. God's Holy Spirit inside of us will guide us according to His plan. But you have to listen and you have to obey. You learn to hear His voice when you have shut out all the other voices in the world. All the voices of torment. All the, the carnal voices around you. When you do that, you start to hear God's voice clearly. So if you don't hear it, you might want to evaluate what is being said around you. What voices are controlling your environment? Proverbs 3, 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. So instead of following our heart or leaning on our own understanding, which is the same thing, we must instead trust in Jesus and follow his plan for our lives, which will be laid out through wise counsel, through the word. It will be a clear, fairly clear path, far more clear than following our heart. Another huge error in understanding of the Bible that we hear commonly is the Bible verse that talks about God giving us the desires of our heart. Psalm 37, 3 through 6 states, Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will act. He will bring forth your righteousness as a light and your justice as a noonday. So here's a clear link between receiving the desires of your heart with you delighting in God, being faithful, committing your way to the Lord and living a righteous life. It's all in there. And in short, it basically says obedience to God is truly essential if you want to be blessed by God. But people somehow see that part. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. They, that's all you hear them say. Mark Ballinger writes of five things that God will often do before he blesses you with the desires of your heart. So these things will come first. Before God gives you the desires of your heart, God will teach you the truth about blessings and cause you to reject both the prosperity gospel and the poverty gospel. The prosperity gospel promises earthly blessings like money, wealth, and health. It promises that if you serve God on earth, you will live your best life now. Nowhere in the Bible are we promised that this life on earth is going to be our best life. In fact, if this is your best life, you just cheated yourself out of what is going to be far more extravagant in heaven. And God has not promised anyone material blessings, although he could bless you with material blessings, but he certainly did not promise them. Therefore, while the prosperity gospel is definitely an unbiblical teaching in our desire to combat these lies, people often end up over at a, pro a poverty gospel, which is also unbiblical. You must read and study the word to say what it really says about the blessings of God. But also understand that it's some people are under the curse of God and you need to know how they got there also. Before God will give you the desires of your heart, he will teach you to delight in him and commit your way to him. So we're not earning things from God, but rather through our obedience, we position ourselves to receive gifts from God because if we earned it, it would not be a gift. And that's true of grace also. Grace is the good we have from God that is not deserved. So obedience is not about earning things from God, but rather following in a path that God is telling us to take that will lead us to blessings that he plans to give us. And before God will give us the desires of our heart, he will sanctify the motives of our heart. So throughout the Bible, there's a direct link between pure motives and powerful prayer. And God sees our hearts. Therefore, when we have bad motives, even when we ask for a good thing, he will often say no to these requests. And I know how that goes. How many of us asked for something thinking that God doesn't really see why I'm asking for this. 
James 4, 2 through 3 states, You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. So if you want God to give you the desires of your heart, you have to first ask God to give you a pure heart that is desiring the right things. We must commit our ways to God, for as Proverbs 16, 2 through 3 says, all of a person's ways seem pure to them, but motives are weighed by the Lord. Commit to the Lord whatever you do, and he will establish your plans. And also, for God to give us the desires of our heart, our desires have been aligned with God's will. Jesus is not in the business to make us happy, but God has made our joy to be intertwined with his glory. So John 15 7 Jesus says how abundantly our father desires to bless us for he states that we should ask whatever we wish and it will be done for us but almost immediately Jesus follows up this statement by pointing out that God is glorified through us bearing fruit as disciples of Jesus when that happens so Jesus naturally mixes our desires and prayers with our desire to please the father so he is not teaching us that God will grant us whatever we wish in the sense that God is trying to make us happy. Rather, if you desire to please the Father through producing fruit that honors him and the kingdom, that desire will be answered by God if you pray for it. He will, keep, he will cause you to keep his commandments so you can abide in God's love, which will then cause your joy to be full. So... As 1 John 3, 22 states, And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. So if you want God to give you the desires of your heart, your heart's desire must be to fulfill the will of God in your life. God will give you the desires of your heart after God has transformed your heart to desire him more than anything else. God's will is very specific to each person's life and season. And one thing is always the same, to glorify God every season. And those who are blessed are the ones rejoicing in God all day long. His glory is what makes us strong, joy-filled. God uses his favor to bring favor to us. God will give you the desire of your heart when your heart has been transformed to worship him above everything else and on judgment day god is not going to degrade on the curve like many think the purpose of the law is not to crush self-confidence romans 3 20 says no one no flesh will be justified in his sight but thanks be to god there's the gospel it says in romans 8 what the law was powerless to do in that it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son who went and did this for over 30 years. He loved God perfectly every moment of his life and he won for us a perfect righteousness that he now offers as a free gift and that is our only hope. That's the righteousness God actually does require and he offers it as a free gift. He says here, Give me all of your wickedness and all of your sin. Then he puts it on Jesus, and Jesus dies under the wrath of all of the sin that the law demanded be paid for. The wrath is seen fully on the cross, but it bought us perfect righteousness. And if we have trusted God for our salvation, this righteousness is then credited to our account. Now we are forgiven. Now God sees us as perfectly righteous because of Jesus. Nothing else, nothing about us. Jesus is the reason. Romans 8, 4 says, For what the law was powerless to do, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of flesh to be a sin offering and so we condemn the flesh in the flesh in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the spirit now god wants and rightfully requires us to obey this he wants us to love him now and for the rest of our life more and more 
as we live by the Spirit, we now obey the law out of just deep love and gratefulness. Andy Davis writes of Jonathan Edwards' treatise on religious affections, which kind of ties up some of this. It was written during the First Great Awakening, likely one of the greatest revivals in all the church history in 1742, when the Holy Spirit was poured out. There were sweeping changes. There was a lot of religious excitement. There were major upheavals. All kinds of things were happening. Huge crowds were leaving their fields and their shops and going to hear the gospel preached, especially George Whitfield. People were coming from miles to hear Whitfield and others preach the gospel, and many people swooned, sometimes even physically under the influence of the gospel, and change happened. We hear those kinds of things today. However, you know in the parable of the seed and the soil, Jesus warned about what they called the stony ground hearers, the ones that hear the word with joy and immediately respond, but when trouble comes, they quickly fall away. And so now, five or six years later, Jonathan Edwards is looking back on the experience of the Great Awakening and what's happened since then. He's probably the most careful thinker, accurate spiritual assessor, maybe in all of church history, and he puts his skills to work in assessing the nature of true revival and more deeply the nature of true religion. A true right relationship with God that is true Christianity, that's what he was looking at. He wanted to know what is the truth. And he likened the initial enthusiasm of many of those hearers of the gospel to cherry blossoms of spring that come each of them promising some sweet cherry fruit later on, but many of them flutter to the ground without ever bearing any fruit at all. And some of them ripen into maturity, but and they do produce delicious cherries. So he wanted to assess spiritual experience and try to get at what was the nature of the true Christian experience. And now there were opposite views of the Great Awakening, two equal and opposite errors concerning all of the excitement and outward emotion. First error is that religion is only a matter of the emotions, the feelings, and especially extreme outward displays of emotion. Raising of hands, melting, falling on the ground, screaming for joy, dancing in the aisles. We've seen it. Big displays of emotion. And if you don't get to that level, you're really not truly saved, is how it appears. But then there's an opposite error that religion is never in any of those displays. And if you see any of them, you know that religion is more in the reason and judgment and in dutiful behavior. Dear friends, both of these are ditches, he says. Edward sought to steer in the middle to try to find what it really was. Satan's scheme here was to push unstable souls into excesses that create a backlash effect. So early in the awakening, Satan pushed people to extremes. They were burning clothes, burning books, doing all kinds of things, and just huge outward displays of emotion. The tendency was, if you don't have all of that, you weren't saved in that. And a few people seemed interested in trying to probe what was really going on, but most were just caught up in all the hoopla. What were the root causes? Eventually, people just threw out the baby with the bathwater, went the opposite direction. They ended up with cold formalism in which no emotional displays were permitted at all. So, as he thought and prayed through, the Lord led him to 1 Peter 1.8. Just listen. Don't turn there. Just listen, he says. Though you have not seen him, Christ, you believe in him. And even though you do not see him now, you love him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. You love him, the invisible one, you believe in him. And now this is what he does. He breaks open the human heart. He breaks open the human heart so that we can see what it actually does. It has two capabilities. First, it can understand. Second, it can have affections towards what it does understand. 
These are the two things the heart does, and we do both all the time. We may not even know we're doing it, but we are. And so first the analytical side, the heart has the ability to perceive everything it encounters and to assess those things, to analyze them, understand them for what they are, to judge them, and that's what the heart does. Secondly, after that, the heart has the ability to be inclined towards or repelled away from the thing it's analyzing and assessing. So you do it without a matter of, of the will. It's not something you're choosing to do. It's just the way of your heart. In short, you're either going to love or hate to a greater or lesser degree everything you analyze in the universe. It has to do with attraction and repulsion. God has designed our heart with the capacity to be attracted to or repelled from everything there is to a greater or lesser degree, all the way down to no attraction or no repulsion because we know nothing about it at all. Our heart puts everything as a positive or a negative. I love it, I don't love it. I desire it, I don't desire it. I want it or I'm going to stay away from it. Everything in the universe, our heart is making a decision about when it encounters it. And God has to be the number one affection to the farthest right as possible. Nothing equal, nothing surpasses. You must love God more than everything else in the universe. And Edwards is saying true religion is in the nature of the attraction to God and that you love him with holy affection. And at the moment of conversion, when that is put in place, many things will get rearranged. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Everything gets rearranged. And then sanctification starts to move things around. You start to hate sin. You start to hate what it does to you. You hate pride. You hate lust. You want more of it out of your life, all of it out of your life. And that's the nature of true religion, of what is going on in your heart when you have true religion. Love for God, then it's measured by cheerful sacrifice in the obedience to his commands. Cheerful sacrifice in obeying his commands. You cannot love God without obeying him. That puts the he knows my heart completely out because if you love him you obey him he says if you cannot obey him you do not love him your heart is so deceived if you think that you can john 14 15 jesus said if you love me you will obey what i command this is love for god to obey his commands and god is telling you if you love me you'll obey my commands and that is sacrificial obedience. It has to cost you something. And if it doesn't cost you something, it isn't love. And God's love for him cost him his son. He's going to make things hard at times just to see if we really do love him. Then you have to do it with joy and delight in your heart. We have to want to obey him. Cheerful, sacrificial obedience. Because God loves a cheerful giver. He does not want someone who is laboring in obedience, long face, it's a terrible life. He wants a cheerful person obeying. So that gives you the ability to somewhat diagnose your own heart. Is there a principle of sacrifice in your relationship with God? Does it cost you anything to be a Christian? Does your quiet time with God cost you something? Does your giving, your financial giving cost you something? Does your service in your ministry to the church cost you something? Does your evangelism cost you something? And when it does, are you doing it cheerfully or do you feel you're compelled without cheerful giving? Do you feel that you have to do it? That you have to prove yourself to God? That you have to prove yourself to others in the church? If that's true, you're back under the law it's unacceptable. That offering is unacceptable. He wants you to want to serve, to give, uh, following his commands, following his laws should be out of our deep desire to obey him. 
all of this must start at the cross so if we feel our heart is distant go back to the cross if you feel that you don't have true love for God that's the heart of the problem right there go back to the cross and understand and ask God to reveal the cross to you where the love of God is displayed fully for us and then we have to bring our wandering hearts back to our love for God because this life was never meant to be about us and what we wanted. James 4, 4 through 10 says, You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred towards God? Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts. You double-minded, grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. So we need to identify our idols, whether it's worldly pleasure, sexual sin, materialism, power, workaholism, worldly entertainment, food. What is the idol that you love more than Jesus? And if you don't know how to find that, you look at where your time is going and you look at where your money is going. Both of them. Just sit there th through the day and write down what you're doing with your time in 15 minute blocks and then keep a ledger on where your money is going and you will see exactly what your idol is at that point. It's, it'll be very clear to you. So you need to identify it and then call it what it is. Adultery. Idolatry that this is the thing you love more than Jesus. Time and money will prove it to you. And this is the reality of being worldly. And God opposes that. He will oppose you. You will need to identify the pride in your heart and you will need to lay all that down. Humbly submit yourself to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. And then the Holy Spirit will turn on the enemy. He will put him to flight if you will stand and you will resist. Choice by choice by choice, you keep Jesus as your only priority. Precious Lord, there is nothing greater than following you. I've done so many things but this is the most amazing my life has ever been. Following you is such a great privilege and we get to see such amazing things happen. And I know you're only getting started. Please forgive us for any idolatry, adultery, anything in our lives that steals anything from what you could be doing with our lives. I ask that you help us, God, to be about your business in the way that you want us to be. I pray for a miracle on everyone who hears this, that they will quickly sort through priorities and decide time is getting short. I better stop messing around with this. My family members are not going to go to heaven. Someone needs to tell them the truth. God is responsible for the details, but we must tell them the gospel. So Jesus, help us to love people more than anything about our lives. Help us to be willing to take great risks, to share the completely true gospel, not some happy version that will keep people around us. Help us to be more faithful to you than people. We completely cast our future, everything we do, Everything we have, it's all yours anyway. We ask that you would order our steps, order our lives, and use us in the greatest possible way. And I ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.